Welcome to DivCasts from University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Before we get started, I uh, want to do our usual housekeeping. Our head chef today is please Casey. So thank you, Casey. Very topical. Uh, we do ask that you um, wash your own station as you leave. So plates in the garbage, food and compost, silverware and soapy vats. Um, if you could fold up your chair, that would be extra special. So. Are there any community announcements today? Does anybody want to mention cops? Do you know it? Yes. I have so many things running through my head. Um, tomorrow at 4.30 in the third floor lecture hall, we will have a guest, uh, Dr. Stephen Lewis, who is the uh, president and director of what's called the Fund for Theological Exploration, which provides um, scholarships and fellowships to both ministry students but also to doctoral students of color and religion. Um, and he's going to be talking about the diversification of theological ex- education both in terms of students and faculty. And so he's a guest of the Divinity School and the um, Diversity Committee. Uh, so you're all welcome to attend and there will be a reception afterwards. But that's tomorrow at 4.30. It's been in the newsletter. I'll probably send a reminder out. But uh, really interesting uh, topic for all who are interested in the study of religion more broadly. So tomorrow, 4.30 in the lecture hall. It would be an excellent follow-up to last week's Wednesday lunch. Right. Uh Professor Charles. Just wanted to mention the uh, Scholarly Conference that's going on today and tomorrow on um, uh, views of astrology um, in classical uh, Arabic, uh, Muslim and Jewish Arabic uh, thought from particularly the 9th to the 13th century. So there'll be more talks this afternoon and then tomorrow. Anyone else? I just want to remind you, next week's lunch is here. We have rescheduled Elboy Reed from Slow Roll Chicago. Um, he works on, it's a bicycling movement basically to bring benefits of bicycling to low income areas. And the week after that is May 27th, and that is our <coughs> annual barbecue. So normally we would hold it there. Obviously, we're not going to do that. It will be beautiful that day, so we will be holding it there. <laughs> So please join us for that lunch. That is your only chance to consume meat products. <laughs> so there'll be another email about that. You can indicate your choice of food. So anyway, on to today's guest, who I'm really particularly thrilled could make it after many, many months of sort of a Twitter war to get him here. He's here. Uh, Matthew Barber is a PhD student in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. Uh, last summer, he was conducting research in northern Iraq when the self-declared Islamic State ethnically cleansed the Yazidi homeland of Sinjar, yes. Sinjar and began a clinic of mass enslavement of Yazidi women. I'm sure you all have seen at least something in the news about it. So uh, Matthew became very involved in advocacy work on behalf of the Yazidis, and he's going to be speaking about that now. So please join me. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Trump. so much. It's really an honor to be... Is that, does that sound right? It sounds kind of tinny. It does sound right. Well, I'll just sound tinny. Okay. Um, it's an honor to be speaking to you here in the, in the Divinity School. I'm really, um, really, really honored to be invited because I love this place. I, I spend as much time here as possible and take as many classes here as I can. Um, I gave a talk in September about some of what happened last year to the Yazidi community, and uh, a few of you may have attended that. So I'm going to minimize redundancies by focusing on uh, some some new things, new developments, some updates about how the situation is progressing. But I'll give a, I'll give a brief overview of everything that transpired from last summer, 
And uh, I'm going to start out by giving a brief introduction to the Yazidi religion itself, which most people require because this is a very generally a very unknown faith. And I'm going to just uh, cheat off of a few notes that I, I uh, uh, put together before moving on to uh, talk about my involvement. And um, let's just uh, begin. Theories about the origins and nature of Yazidism over the past century and a half have been abundant and divergent. The leading contemporary scholars of Yazidism, however, understand it to represent the product of a process in which the indigenous Kurdish-speaking people of northern Iraq, northeastern Syria, and eastern Anatolia absorbed elements from numerous Near Eastern religious traditions such as Zoroastrianism, Manichaeism, Mithraism, Judaism, and Islamic Sufism, all of which became fused into a unique and distinct religious framework with its own indigenous underpinnings. Now, most of you probably know this better than me, but as I understand it, the term syncretism has lost currency within religious uh, studies because to call a religious tradition a syncretism suggests that there are other traditions that are not syncretisms and therefore pure. When in reality, all traditions borrow, exchange, are influenced by elements of different, different traditions. Um, however, the composite nature of Yazidism is such that it has been one of the holdouts for which the term syncretism has hung on in the usage of a number of scholars who study it. Now, in studying Yazidism, you will quickly see that it is not merely a mishmash of pieces snatched up from other faiths. Though it has inherited a, re a religious vocabulary and many concepts from other traditions, it is something very unique. The Yazidi religion is old, but not necessarily an ancient Mesopotamian religion, as some popular claims would suggest. It does preserve some very ancient ritual and narrative elements, including some old Iranian material that apparently predates Zoroastrianism. However, the Yazidism of today is the product of a long evolution, and the current form of the tradition began to take shape in the early 12th century. So according to Yazidi religious thought, God is a singular creative source that has manifested itself through multiple emanations, specifically seven divine beings or holy angels, that are entrusted with the affairs of the world. The chief of these, to whom God delegated many of the affairs of creation, is called the peacock angel, or Melechtos. This is why the motif of the peacock is common in these city homes, such as this um, on, the, on a wooden door leading into a house. And here's some, some Yazidi artwork that kind of represents these, these emanations, these holy beings, that um, each of which is God in the tradition. Now, Yazidis also believe that the seven divine beings that emanate from God have been incarnated in our world at multiple times in history. However, the names by which the Yazidis refer to them are taken from a group of early 12th century figures who lived in the Hakkari Mountains of Kurdistan and who are understood to have been incarnations at that time. The most important of these was a Sufi named Sheikh Adi bin Musafir, who was from present-day Lebanon and who traveled to Kurdistan where he worked as a spiritual teacher. Many Sufi ideas seem to have been transmitted to the local people due to his presence, and Sheikh Adi himself became taken up by Yazidi tradition as a manifestation of God. His tomb is believed to be in Lalish, a village in northern Iraq that is considered the holiest religious site for the Yazidi community, to which many make pilgrimages each year. And this is the, the temple that is built on that site over Sheikh Adi's remains, and it's considered uh, the holiest uh, place of pilgrimage for Yazidis. Now, even though this peacock angel is not an evil figure like the Satan of Christianity and Islam. The fact that he is a glorious chief angel, as Lucifer was, has prompted some non-Yazidi observers over the centuries to associate this figure with Satan. Therefore, the Yazidis have long been the victims of the harmful label of devil worshippers. Now, for those of you who grew up reading Genesis, it's easy to understand how the image of the snake by the door of the temple might reinforce this idea. However, if you ask Yazidis about this snake, they will tell you that it's taken from a story in which um, Noah's Ark had a hole in the bottom and the snake coiled itself up inside to plug the hole and save everyone inside. And I thought that that was... Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I, I thought that that story maybe uh, was part of Islamic tradition, but I was just glancing through a book about flood narratives uh, in Near Eastern traditions the other day, and, and I realized that um, this story about the snake plugging this hole is, is common in quite a number of places and many traditions in the Near East. 
and, and it also actually is associated with, with Satan and sometimes that snake is associated with Satan so I think there's still some interesting questions there to look at um, this is the same temple from the from the top has, has these conical spires on the top as do most Yazidi shrines and here are Yazidi families visiting the temple making a pilgrimage there that I took this in 2012 Alright, another important aspect of the Yazidi religion is that it is an oral tradition without a written scripture. It is the responsibility of clerical functionaries known as kohls to memorize the faith's oral texts, which consist of hymns and some prose narratives, and to recite them on various occasions. And this man is the Radis al Kawalin. He's the head of this group of, of uh, men who, who learn to play the nai, the flute, and sing these. these uh, oral traditions, the forms of hymns at different religious uh, occasions. <clears throat> Often when the when this takes place, there's a procession, and this image of uh, the peacock angel, represents the peacock angel, is parading through the streets of villages. And I wanted to provide you with these images just to kind of give you a sense of, you know, some the aesthetic, what some of some of what the appearance of these shrines and just introduce you a little bit to the people that I'm talking about today. Now, the man on the far right is another one of the top DCD religious figures. He's one of the one of the top five uh, religious leaders for the community, and uh, he's called the Peshman. That's the name of his title. And what's very interesting is that over time, uh, Yazidism had a prohibition on obtaining literacy. People were prevented from learning to read and write. It was a tenet within the within the faith itself. And this was a measure that was adopted to protect people from uh, losing the, the oral tradition by beginning to read the Bible or the Quran. So you can, in some of the oral texts, you can you can find warnings about the Bible and the Quran and how they are false books and, and devious. And so, in order to prevent people from reading them and to maintain the the oral traditions, literacy was was prohibited. But this man represents a group of people within the tradition, the only group that was traditionally allowed to learn to read and write, so that they could carry out certain scholarly functions that were important for the community, such as legitimizing um, the validity of, of marriages and, and so forth. Today, this uh, prohibition is gone, and everybody is learning to read and write and studying. In the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, Yazidis began to get university education in Iraq and Turkey and other places. And, but, uh, but during the colonial period when the state was forming, the fact that Yazidis, um, made, there were only a handful of Yazidis at that point that could read and write. And that created a serious disadvantage for the community in terms of its ability to represent its own interests in the newly forming Iraqi state. So it's been a very difficult journey for Yazidis to progress from that time when they basically had no political power or influence to today, they're actually quite a sizable minority in, in northern Iran. Uh, this is the Baba Sheikh, who is probably the most important uh, public figure for the Yazidi religious leadership. And he has various religious duties within the holy city of, of, of Lalish, holy village. And he works in some of the shrines there. And I'm not going to have time today to talk much about ritual practice, and it would be a very complex discussion. But I do want to give a sense of some of the pictures of some of the sites of religious practice, which usually take the form of these small shrines that exist in every, almost every village, where prayers are offered. And the, cust the custodians of these shrines can be men and women. This woman is carrying coals that she's going to use to light censers. And here we're in the inside of this shrine. And what's interesting is each shrine is dedicated. It venerates one of those holy beings that I mentioned that are part of the Yazidi. Uh, some, some refer to it as a pantheon. Um, and each shrine also has a specific religious purpose. So this particular shrine is frequented by people suffering from emotional or mental troubles. And it's believed that the holy presence that inhabits this shrine is particularly suited to the healing of those kinds of ailments. Here's a cemetery with the shrine in the background. Here's a woman bringing her, her young boys to uh, visit one of the shrines where certain rituals are performed. And then these are some pilgrims from Sinjar 
which have come to this village. The village where I took this photograph is in the Nineveh plain. It's called Bashika. Unfortunately, it's under IS control today. The main temple with the snake by the door that I showed you, that temple is not uh, under IS control. I'm happy to report that it is uh, still standing. But this shrine that these men are, are visiting, this one has been destroyed this last year, as has this one. And these three as well. So that kind of brings us up to talking about what happened last year. And this tragedy, this crisis that started, began in August, August 3rd, when the IS uh, jihadist group attacked the Sinjar area from Mosul and basically took control of it with, with very minimal resistance, displaced over 300,000 people in a single day, and took many captive. And one of the important things to understand is that upon that attack, the Peshmerga soldiers that were there to defend that mountain, they fled without a fight. So they basically abandoned the Yazidis to their fate. And if they had defended for just a single day, a lot of people could have been evacuated and we wouldn't be facing the enslavement phenomenon that I'm here to talk about today. So I mention these things because to understand what the Yazidis are facing right now, it's important to understand that they feel very betrayed by the Kurdistan regional government, whose forces worked hard to, to defend oil-rich areas last summer, but basically left Sinjar without firing a single bullet. So I was in the city of Doha, which is 30 miles north of Mosul, when this attack happened, and the refugees began to flow in from Sinjar into my area, and the streets were just endless caravans of cars like this with, with children hanging out of the trunks because you're trying to you know, evacuate an entire region and there's not enough vehicles to transport everyone out. And people, I began to go around and visit people who, who, were, who were fleeing and they were basically just taking up residence in schools or any empty buildings and there was such devastation and such, just such hurt and despondency everywhere. And people were sleeping on the ground outside any empty building or schools. Here they are in the, in, in the classrooms of schools. And now, you know, this, this lasted for several months like this and now most of these people have been moved into camps and are staying in tents but hundreds of thousands of them are still just living in a very kind of limbic state right now, uncertain future. And here they are, here's an empty warehouse building, families just squatting on the, on the ground. Nobody was really sure what, what was gonna come next. And I went around and interviewed people trying to understand what the nature of the tragedy was, what they had experienced, and I won't give you a lot of those narratives, those accounts right now, because uh, there are just so many of them. But one example is this family. They have 10 children, and they couldn't flee before the, the IS fighters took control of the city of Sinjar. And Muslim neighbors sheltered them inside their home for three days, kept them hidden inside. And then one night, in the middle of the night, they ventured outside, and the older children and the parents held the, held the babies and, and put their hands over their mouths so they wouldn't make any sound. Then they just made a run for it through the darkness, and they succeeded in getting out of the city, and they walked for three days through the desert to find shelter. And they had an 11th daughter, an oldest child, and she was shot by an IS sniper. She was in another location, and she was shot when she ventured out um, to find a water source. So, you know, I, I just encountered story after story full of atrocities, full of violence. It was unbelievable. The people I interviewed who, who witnessed um, people being killed in front of them, you know, I interviewed an 11-year-old boy whose father was shot before his eyes, and you know, this just this just went on and on. But one of the one of the things that began to emerge right from the beginning, as I was talking to people, was this expression of concern for the female family members. And a lot of families were telling me, "Yeah, we need to get out of here. We need to get out of Iraq. We need to get into Turkey. We have to leave because they're coming for our women." I kept hearing this, and I was I was thinking, "Well, what do you mean?" And then I started to hear people saying look, our daughters are missing, my sister's missing, my cousin's missing. People were telling me that their female family members had been kidnapped, but they managed to keep their cell phones sitting with them, some of them. And they were calling and were in, in contact with these families. So as I and other volunteers began to go around and speak to people, this picture began to emerge of a premeditated campaign to basically attack the mountain and attack the city next to the mountain. And carry out as many 
women as possible. And I spoke to eyewitnesses who said that when the fighters were coming up the mountain, they were stopping convoys of cars fleeing people. It would make everyone get out. If they were Muslim, they would send them back to Sinjar. But if they were Yazidi, they would separate the men from the women, and they would load the women onto empty trucks that they had brought along for this purpose. And that's when I started to realize that this, this whole targeted campaign, the sexually motivated campaign, was not something that was just kind of the incidental, opportunistic kind of rape that, that corresponds to any instance of, of chaos and warfare, but it was a much larger strategy to basically enslave um, a large number of women. So I came back to the U.S. and began to work with some Yazidi volunteers here who were working on this problem, and people that were working with our team inside Northern Iraq who were keeping track of the numbers accounted for almost 5,000 missing Yazidi people by name. The more, majority of these were women, and we thought that you know, our, our larger estimate was between five and 7,000 of, of total missing people, including men and children. And part of the way that this number was generated was by people in our team keeping track of the locations of those women and speaking to those women on the phone. So I would speak to a woman in a village near, near Tel Afar who had been taken from Sinjar, moved there, and then you know, she would be able to tell us, um, okay, there's like, we would say count, count the number of uh, people with you, so she would say, okay, there's 250 prisoners in my location. We would, we would speak to people. If we could just speak to one person that had a cell phone in each location, we could get a fairly accurate idea of how many people there were, how many jihadists were guarding them, uh, what their conditions, what their situation was, if they had illnesses, if they, had, if they were uh, missing food and, and so forth. And so then our, our purpose was then to try to start strategizing from here I worked with UGDs here in the U.S. on this. How can we try to rescue them? How can we try to save them? This was very difficult. Well, one of the first things that we were met with was skepticism. I mean, this was a this was a tremendous phenomenon, and the media didn't cover it very much. This was, if we're thinking about um, several thousand women being kidnapped, it was like what happened in Nigeria when the when Boko Haram kidnapped the 200 schoolgirls, but on a much more massive scale. And yet, this situation got much less media attention. I think part of it was just disbelief. It, it was very difficult for people to wrap their heads around the idea that this could be happening. And a lot of uh, I, IS supporters were denying it as well and countering uh, myself and others when we would speak on the media. They would say, well, this is not true. They would, online they would say this. But then, ironically, IS released their own manifesto on this uh, situation. They have a magazine called Dabek, and in this edition of it, which came out, I think it was September or early, early October, um, it contained an article. That's that's the, the bad thing, by the way, with the ice flag on, on top. Of it. Uh, they, they they contained an article basically disclosing their their entire program, the slavery program, and I think that uh, this sort of woke people up to the fact that yes, they they are doing this. This is happening. They're targeting the Yazidis, and I think it's important to talk a little bit about the religious justifications that IS uses. You know, there's this whole debate raging here in the country about you know. Uh, whether whether IS has something to do with Islam or has nothing to do with Islam. And I, I am so tired of hearing that debate. I think it's just so misguided because it's not getting at any of the, of the meaningful questions. Obviously, a lot of the people that are like trying to, you know, the president must say that this is about Islam. It's like they're, they're, they have an agenda to try to equate IS with, with Islam generally, with, with the, the mainstream Islam practiced by most Muslims. And while that's just absurd, I think what's important is to consider how IS is using Islam, how they're using scriptural justifications for what they're doing. And one of the important themes that that you know emerged from last summer was that they approached the Yazidis differently than they approached any of the other minority groups. So I was also living in Doha when they expelled Mosul's Christian community. Some of you remember they painted the Arabic letter noon on the fronts of houses to identify that it was a Christian home that they were going to appropriate the wealth of. They expelled all the Christians from the city, but they did not do a wide-scale campaign of enslavement or of slaughter. Some Christians were killed in the process of the fighting, but overall, they did not target the Christians with this kind of violence. It was different. And a lot of this had to do with their evaluation of the, of the character of the Yazidi religion. 
So I mentioned that it had this oral tradition. It doesn't have a written scripture. So from the perspective of these fighters, or these, uh, this, this group, whatever it is, the Yazidis don't qualify for the rights and protections that are afforded to the Islamic category of people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab. And it's, it's impossible for them to be Ahl al-Kitab when they don't have a book, when they, don't have, they can't be people of the book if they don't have a book. Another uh, aspect is the fact that their religion, even though they claim to be monotheists, and you know, I respect their claim, obviously it's not my place to make that judgment, um, the, the multiple emanations in, in how they conceptualize deity is viewed by Salafists as a form of polytheism. So these jihadists re- rely on their interpretation of what they think was the practice of the, of the first generation or, or the Islamic community and how it differentiated between polytheists and uh, people of the book, which are basically Jews and Christians. So this is very uh, discouraging, and I think what's, what's really important to think about, though, is that this actually has a precedent. Uh, I, we, we all know that IS is a modern, it's a contemporary movement. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, resemble you know, uh, Islamic governance through history. And the approach they took with the Christians, for example, was so divergent from how Christians existed under, under Ottoman rule, where they basically flourished. But when it came to the Yazidis, the Ottoman practice was actually pretty similar to what IS is doing, and they actually used very similar religious justifications. So there were multiple campaigns of forced conversion against Yazidis in Sinjar. Sometimes this involved beheadings. It's very similar to what IS did in the summer. Um, there was a village called Kojo, which is south of the Sinjar Mountain. And on August 15th, after all of this happened, the IS jihadists round up, rounded up uh, all the men of the town, and they said, we give you the option to convert or not convert. If you don't convert, we'll let you rejoin your families in, in Kurdistan province. So the men said, all right, we're not going to convert. They slaughtered all of them, 412 men. This was last August, August 15th. They killed them all. Yazidis now are going back and discovering mass graves with, with a lot of these bodies. They didn't kill the women because whether the women converted or not was sort of immaterial. They were going to keep them and use them as concubines, it's this form of sexual slavery which they feel is justified. So my point is that, you know, in, the, in terms of the Yazidi cultural memory, there's a this persecution complex in the sense that we have always been targeted with this kind of ethnic cleansing. And during the Ottoman era, similar things happened multiple times, both in the Nineveh Plain and in Sinjar. And a lot of it was motivated by policy changes. You know, you had the centralization of the uh, late 19th century. But a lot of this violence started in the 17th century and continued until the, 20th, the turn of the 20th century. And uh, it, it often involved um, campaigns against Sinjar, the kidnapping of Yazidi women, carrying them off and selling them in the slave markets of Anatolia, places like Medellin. So when the Yazidis say, this is the 74th genocide that has occurred against our community, it, there's not a historical record by which we can enumerate you know, genocides. but. Um, it kind of gives this sense that um, this violence has been unceasing through through the through the ages, and there's there's some there's some truth in that. Now, I will just mention, moving on towards our work, this man was a humanitarian uh, worker, and he was he was working with Yazidis in. in Reveals some refugees are in, in Dohuk, and he met this man. This is not my photo. He he posted this online, and it just broke my heart because this man came out to show him photographs of his uh, of his children, his, his girls and family members that were missing. And the aid worker posted a caption on the photos, and he said, uh, "They took my daughters and my wife, killed my relatives, and destroyed my home. Why should I live?" And. Uh, <clears throat> That's the last of like the tragedy photos I'm going to show you. I'm not going to hit you over the head with that a lot, but I do think it's important to dwell a little bit on really the, the traumatic nature of, of the suffering and the fact that so many families have been they're missing, like many family members, men and women, mostly women. Now the good news is um, 1,700 Yazidis have so far escaped or been released. And a lot of their releases are, are secured through ransom money coming from the Kurdistan province or from family members. But quite a number are still in captivity. And 
for anybody that wants to learn more about this, I recommend this Amnesty International report called Escape from Hell. It has really good accounts, really good interviews with some of the Yazidi survivors. And what's very important, I think, is that you see in the accounts here how a lot of the women and girls that have escaped and gone back to Kurdistan, they've been able to do so by the help of local Arab Sunnis, many of which are completely opposed to, to what I assume. They're just abhorred by this. I mean, a lot of people have these neighbors for, for a long time. They, they know these people as part of the fabric of the communities of Iraq. And these cities have been subjected to a lot of racism and, and prejudice, but at the same time, um, many enjoy very good relations with their neighbors. So a lot of people are um, working underground to try to help women escape. One of the accounts even was from a girl who um, was purchased by an IS member himself, an IS fighter, who told her, I think this is wrong, what's being done to you. I'm gonna help you escape. So he bought her from the institution that's been set up to sell these women to different, different places. And he and his wife helped her escape. A lot of other stories of women, wives of fighters, helping girls escape. Because they're not pleased when, you know, the man brings home a new slave girl. I, it's just sounds a bit absurd. I know it's almost comical, but this is basically, you know, the language being used in everything. Another report that I really recommend is from Human Rights Watch, and it's called I ISIS Escapees Describe Systematic Rape. This is the most recent one. This is just a few weeks old. And they, have, they had so many new escapees to interview, and the youngest survivors who, who were reporting having been raped were, were 12 years old. We have another story of uh, the youngest that we know of is, is a nine-year-old girl who's pregnant now, and she's been flown to Germany for basically medical treatment because the pregnancy is endangering her life. So, so our response as advocates for this whole dilemma has basically involved three fronts, media, uh, politics, and humanitarian side. Like I mentioned, the media just haven't really dwelt on this. Like last summer, there was some interest and BBC and uh, NPR interviewed me and uh, it, you know, there was some, some you know, momentum, but it seemed to die off. So myself and others, we worked really hard to try to keep engaging journalists about this issue. And I tried to work, I probably worked with about 100 journalists from last summer until now. And we feel like we succeeded in this, in this front in generating more interest and getting journalists to go back to Kurdistan and do a lot of interviews. So there's been some really excellent reporting um, through the fall and the winter. And a lot of people, a lot of journalists with New York Times, with The Telegraph, a lot of outlets, they went to northern northern Iraq. I would arrange their contacts with people. They would interview some of the survivors, and there was some there were some uh, good stories coming out. I'm exhausted. I'm not doing this work anymore. I don't recommend trying to do this kind of thing while you're in grad school. It's just insane. But the urgency of the of the dilemma kind of called for it. Um, the other the other side is the political our political engagement. So this is a Yazidi delegation from northern Iraq that visited. Washington, and we visited um, the State Department. We had multiple meetings. We had people talking to the Department of Defense. And we met with, with Ben Rhodes, the man in the middle of the blue tie. He's President Obama's kind of key person for Middle East uh, policy. And this was very historic. It was the first time for the Yazidi religious leadership to visit this country and also to, to visit uh, officials in, in Washington and the White House. And everywhere we went, I was the only member of this delegation that was not easy. Everywhere we went, the message was the same. We were asking for coordination with Kurdish ground forces inside northern Iraq to help rescue these groups of people that were still captive. And we thought it was very doable. Obama had already ordered the airstrike program last summer, which stopped the jihadists from continuing into Erbil and into Doha. They came within 15 miles of Doha, where I was where I was living. I was terrified. I had my suitcase open. I was ready to, to flee, the, flee the country. The only thing that stopped their advance were, were the airstrikes. So when the delegation came, we said, look, you're, you're bombing IS all over the place, just kind of randomly here and there inside Syria, inside Iraq. Please work with Kurdish troops and target these particular villages where these people are being held. Let ground troops come in, and uh, Kurdish ground troops, and, and, and free them. We thought this was very possible. And this did not happen. And months went by, and what was happening was we watched this opportunity to free them disappear, because we were keeping track of where they were and everything. And the opportunity to, to free them disappeared as fighters began to just move them deeper into Syria. They took them as far away as Aleppo. 
and, and different to Iraq as far away as Fallujah. So now we've lost the chance really to do a, the most effective kind of rescue operation that could have taken place. An operation did take place in December finally, which was kind of what we had been asking for. The Kurdish Special Air Guard basically organized a, a campaign, moved westward from Doha, reached Sinjar Mountain, but they didn't liberate the city, still under IS control till today, which means a lot, most of these can't go home still. And they didn't go to any of those villages where there were still some people uh, held, where we had the chance to, um, to free them. Now, I know I painted a really bleak picture, <laughs> but I want to say we feel very hopeful about the fact that escapees are continuing to emerge. And I am sure that what we're going to see is long into the future, a slow trickle of kidnapped girls and, and women continuing to escape and make their way back to, to Kurdistan. And there are still a number of men also captive. The, the, the men that are still alive, that are captive, have agreed to convert to Islam, and they're being subjected to a sort of indoctrination program where they're being trained according to IS's you know, unique ideology. And uh, I got some reports a week ago of a couple of new families that escaped from Raqqa. This, these escapes happen when, when local tribesmen basically go in and free them and help them escape into the desert and then take them through the desert and over to the, to the border. But these families escaped and they had two 13-year-old boys that wouldn't leave with them because the, the boys had already started to be put through this, uh, you know, these like, military training camps. You've probably seen on, online these pictures of like young kids wearing like military garb and, and you know, they've got their machine guns and they're, you know, chanting nasheeds and so forth. And uh, the kids wouldn't leave. So IS is turning some of the young boys into, into fighters and everything. But the hope is that, you know, more and more people are escaping. And the third area of advocacy, which was humanitarian, uh, a push for humanitarian work, we also succeeded to some degree in that area in terms of getting aid for, for people in the refugee camps. And our focus now, I'm very discouraged with the political side. I don't think it's very effective. But what I think we, where we can really make a difference is by supporting specifically therapeutic uh, responses. So medical services, but also um, mental health and emotional therapy. There are, there are Kurdish women uh, therapists in Northern Iraq who are going and visiting some of these uh, people, but it, 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 there's thousands of traumatized people and traumatized women, and the the need is very serious. So we're we're looking now to uh, you know garner more more support to help bring in trained professionals who are actual therapists that can that can work with grief and trauma and abuse and and, and rape victims and so forth. So I present all this today because as people who study religion. It's important to think about a very vulnerable community that is at risk of disappearing from the world today. The largest Yazidi diaspora is in Germany, and a lot of people are trying to leave now. But Yazidi religion is very connected to place. It's very connected to land and, and holy sacred places. If people continue to migrate and leave these places, it's a it's another tradition that will, that will disappear. So thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.